Hi, my name is Lillian Holmes. I work at the Pacific Institute, and I'm here to talk about the business case for water stewardship, why water stewardship helps strengthen your business over the short and the long term, and how you can get started. The Pacific Institute is a research organization on water and climate issues, and we support the United Nations Global Compact CEO Water Mandate, which is how this presentation was developed. To start with an overview, I'll begin with the facts of the world water crisis. I'll go into why water stewardship is good for business and the water stewardship journey, which is one way that companies set and achieve water goals. And finally, I'll give a brief intro to the UN Global Compact's CEO water mandate. The world water crisis encompasses many different aspects, such as water scarcity, pollution, climate change, and more. I'm going to start with water scarcity. This is an image of the Aral Sea in Central Asia, and it shows a really stark picture of how water supply is changing. Humans withdraw about 4,000 cubic kilometers of water globally every year, and that's three times what we withdrew 50 years ago. And withdrawals continue to increase. Global demand for water is predicted to increase by 55% from the year 2000 to 2050. All around, we face a growing challenge to meet all of humanity's water needs. Today, 1.7 billion people live in river basins where water demand outstrips supply, known as water stressed areas. And by 2050, that number is expected to jump to 5 billion. In fact, the World Economic Forum has consistently ranked water crisis among the top global risks. In fact, it's been in the top for the past seven years. Even if there is adequate water in an area, the basin can still experience water stress due to pollution. Nearly all human uses of water from agricultural, industrial, municipal, result in water pollution. And currently over 80% of the world's wastewater is discharged back into rivers, streams, and oceans without any treatment. This causes widespread damage to ecosystems, and it also contaminates critical human water sources. Around the world, billions of people lack access to drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene. We use the acronym WASH. 2.1 billion people still lack access to safe drinking water, while 4.5 billion people lack safely managed sanitation services. And every year, over 300,000 children under five die due to diarrhea-related disease which is most commonly caused by lack of access to wash. And finally, climate change is going to continue to make water challenges worse. We are already seeing increased intensity of water-related natural events like droughts and floods. This trend is expected to continue. As an example of how the climate crisis can affect the water cycle, when temperatures rise, snow melts earlier and faster, and this causes flooding in the winter. While in summer, water supplies are diminished, causing droughts. But that's just one example of climate change effect on water. In temperate or tropical areas, climate change is changing weather patterns, it's changing ocean currents. There's many ways that climate change affects water. And all together, more and more people are at risk due to climate change related water effects. The number of people at risk from floods is projected to hit 1.6 billion in 2050. On the other extreme, as we've already talked about, drought causes water stress and it will intensify the already increasing global water demand crisis. Now that I've given that introduction of some of the ways that water causes a crisis for people around the world, let's talk about why water stewardship is a great opportunity for businesses to understand and address their water risk reduce their costs, and more. Water stewardship is a set of practices to sustainably and equitably manage fresh freshwater resources. And we like to say that it's good for the planet, good for people, and good for business. And that last part is really the key takeaway of this presentation. If you get one thing from this presentation, let it be that taking action on water is not just about a charity or a philanthropy, although it certainly is great for businesses to care about water for those reasons. 
Instead, I really want to make the case that addressing water risk is about protecting your business. This diagram shows that there are two categories of water risk. The first is risk that is caused by the company's own actions because they're polluting or wasteful and stakeholders have concerns. But on the right hand side, you see risk due to context that a company can't control. So a company could be incredibly efficient and responsible, but if it's acting in a place where shared water resources are poorly managed, it still faces risk. So water stewardship, it's not just about being a good actor yourself. It's also about ensuring that the river basins in which you operate are sustainably managed. I want to dive in to several examples of the kinds of water risks that companies face. And I'm starting with operational and supplier disruptions. You can see this is a big risk for companies. In fact, in 2016, the companies that reported to CDP said that they faced 14 billion US dollars of water related losses. So one way that water affects business is by disrupting their operations or the operations of their suppliers. This is because many leading industries require water as a production process input or as an ingredient in their products, which makes them vulnerable to water shortages and drought, or even if the water is abundant, but it's too polluted to use. And what's really key about this slide is it's not just about the disruptions that water can create in your own facilities and your own processes. Companies can also face risk if their suppliers experience water stress. If your suppliers face a disruption due to a water related issue, you may still be unable to procure the goods to produce your own products. One example of an unconventional or complicated disruption caused by water stress. In recently, Brazil has faced a drought that caused uh, water prices to rise, and it also caused the cost of electricity to rise because Brazil uses hydropower. General Motors estimated that this drought cost them 2.1 million US dollars extra in water prices and 5.9 million US dollars extra in electricity prices. So this can be a really severe disruption to business. Even if there's physically enough water for companies to continue production in a basin, and the price of water remains stable, companies can still lose their license to operate if they are perceived as unfairly contributing to a river basin's water-related challenges through pollution or excessive water use. I have legal loss license to operate up on the slide. That's if there's a change in policy by local regulators, but companies also face a risk to their social license to operate if community activism disrupts their business. And one example would be Coca-Cola actually was forced to shut a plant in India due to perceptions in the community that the company used too much of the groundwater supply. That's related to the next risk or brand damage. And it's consistently listed as a top risk by companies that report to CDP. Consumers are growing more and more deliberate about the social impacts of their purchases. You hear the phrase voting with their dollars, and that's why brand damage is becoming such an important water risk. I also wanted to mention employee absenteeism. This is usually due to lack of access to wash services. That's drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene. Lack of access to wash harms workers, and it really diminishes productivity for companies if workers do not have sufficient wash access, they're way more likely to become ill due to waterborne diseases. And this can also affect workers if they have to stay home to take care of ill children. One example of how a company really successfully addressed this issue at Newmont Mining in Ghana, improving company sanitation systems led to a 30% reduction in the incidence of diarrhea, which saved the community thousands of dollars in health costs. And finally, if you want proof that there's a business case for water stewardship, look no further than the investment community, which is increasingly demanding that companies demonstrate awareness of water risk. For example, through CDP, 
650 investors with 87 US dollars per name, 87 trillion US dollars in assets are urging companies to both report their water related risks and impacts and take action to mitigate them. And you can see this chart shows how the CDP investor signatories and the assets that they represent has grown and grown. So that concludes the risk portion of this presentation, but I also wanted to discuss how water stewardship can directly save your company money. For companies new to water stewardship, the payback period for initial water efficiency investments can be less than one year. An example of companies that have really saved a lot of money through water use efficiency, Diageo estimates that they saved 3.2 million US dollars in the year 2014 by reducing uh, the volume of the water that they withdrew. And Cisco introduced a new soldering practice that they estimate by reducing both water use and wastewater production saves them a million US dollars every year. There's also the opportunity for new business opportunities created by water efficiency and water stewardship practices. For example, the chemical company BASF estimates that they may face potential sales of a billion US dollars from products related to water use efficiency, recycling, reuse, drinking water treatment. So now that I've introduced why water stewardship is a crucial step for businesses, I want to discuss how businesses can begin to take action on water. Every business is going to have its own unique water stewardship journey, depending on the industry sector, suppliers, locations. With that said, the CEO water mandate has developed this framework called the water stewardship journey to show some of the major parts of a really strong water stewardship strategy. To unpack this diagram, it illustrates the ideal range of water stewardship activities. Starting at the left, actions around operations typically are a good starting place. As you move to the right of this diagram, the actions become more involved, but ultimately more impactful. Let's start with operations. This step is really around ensuring a company's own house is in order, whether that means corporate offices, agricultural sites, or manufacturing sites. The typical topics to address around operations include providing drinking water sanitation and hygiene access to all workers, establishing a baseline of water use by measuring and monitoring water performance, and then as much as possible, improving the water use efficiency and reducing pollution. And I want to say that in this step of the water stewardship journey, Taking action around your own operations really establishes your company's credibility when you engage with stakeholders, fellow businesses, and NGOs on water issues. It's a really important first step. Another important aspect of water stewardship is co context assessment. And something that's really key to water challenges is that they are inherently local. Climate is different. Emissions reduction will have the same benefit regardless of where a company reduces emissions. So for companies, the goal is to reduce their global emissions. But for water, the impacts and risks vary substantially by location. If you reduce water use only where water is abundant, that's going to have minimal impact. So for water, really considering the location allows you to have the greatest impact. When companies choose to address context, they begin by understanding the geographical basins that are water stressed and high risk and they also assess risk and impacts along the value chain so when they know which of their operations are experiencing the most water stress they can then prioritize actions that's really the goal of the context step prioritizing where and how to act once a company has established some water stewardship practices, it's a great idea to also develop a strategy, a comprehensive water stewardship plan for your company. And this step really means integrating water stewardship into the business plan. Again, not as charity or not just for charity, but as a way to protect your business from the risks that we've discussed in this presentation. As I discussed, much of the risk that companies face is not due to their own operations, but due to the context in which they're operating. 
So the engagement step is really about going beyond the fence line to work with other businesses, value chain partners, NGOs, stakeholders to ensure water security for an entire watershed. And this is where the good work that you've done in your own operations within your fence line will help establish credibility. So typically at this stage, companies work to advance water security through collective action, and they also look up and down the value chain to facilitate improved performance. It's crucial that throughout this process, a company's understanding of its risks and approaches is done in dialogue with the stakeholders most affected. That's an ongoing process of communicating with and reporting to stakeholders. So that was one sample of how a, a company can begin to engage around water. And I want to quickly give an overview of the CEO water mandate and hopefully establish that we can support your company in your water goals. The CEO water mandate, as I've said, is a United Nations global compact water stewardship commitment platform. Our endorsers sign a pledge to report annually on their water performance and improve across six different areas related to water. And it's really important that our platform is open to both leaders and learners. Some of our endorsers are really at the forefront of water stewardship. They're developing cutting edge practices, but for other businesses that are CEO water mandate endorsers, they're really new to thinking about water. And the mandate is a way for them to join a community and hopefully learn how they can act around water. Mandate endorsers commit to action, but they also access resources and gain ways to collaborate with partners. Over 175 businesses have endorsed the mandate. This is just a sample of a few of our endorsers. So you can see that your business would certainly be in good company. To give a preview of some of the resources that we offer, the Water Stewardship Toolbox is a library where you can search by topic to find many different resources related to water. And the Water Stewardship University is a course designed to help those new to water stewardship gain some of the tools and vocabulary that will help them. And I really want to uh, offer that if you are curious to learn more after this presentation, the Water Stewardship University, which you'll find on our website, would be a really great starting place. We also have a weekly mandate newsletter and the Water Action Hub. The hub is a website that is a global, a free global um, platform where you can collaborate with others around water issues as well as find knowledge uh, shared by your peers. And then finally, the mandate hosts networking opportunities such as peer-to-peer -peer workshops. I want to describe the mandate's two key opportunities for deeper engagement. Within the mandate, the action platform is a collaborative network of mandate endorsers. Ma uh, action platform members gain early access to tools right at the forefront of water stewardship, and of course, also demonstrate leadership around water. And finally, action platform members can actually shape the direction of the mandate through our steering council. So that's the first of the two opportunities for deeper engagement. The second is separate from the action platform, the Mandates Water Resilience Coalition. This is a new initiative we just launched in March uh, of 2020 on World Water Day. And the Water Resilience Coalition is a CEO-led, industry-driven coalition that seeks to preserve the world's freshwater resources in the face of climate change. And the coalition seeks to do this through collective action in water stress basins by elevating global water stress to the top of the corporate agenda and finally by setting concrete measurable targets to achieve by 2050. Just to wrap up again the takeaway from this presentation is water stewardship can both achieve sustainable water management and strengthen your business Again, not just as a charity activity, but as a way to address the short and long-term risk that your business faces. I'm here at the Mandate 
to help you understand those risks and make a plan for action. And I would encourage you to reach out if you are left with questions after this presentation or if you are interested in learning more. I can help direct you to some of our resources or set up a conversation. And my email address is on the slide, but it's lholmes, that's L-H-O-L-M-E-S, at packinst.org. I hope to hear from you and thank you so much for your time.